Let's welcome in our first guest, Senate, the state Senate candidate, Michael Folk. Mike, good morning to you, and he brought goodies, I might add. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, brownies. Who made the brownies, Mike? Uh, my middle daughter, Rebecca, she's the brownie expert, and we brought some uh, fresh from the cow probably yesterday, raw milk. <laughs> Uh, I won't let you drink it, though, because the law is not in effect yet. That's true. You have to wait That's until... Uh, and my understanding, if correct me if I'm wrong, and I haven't read the bill, to be to be blunt, uh, although I was part of a herd sharing when, when that came about, uh, I believe it allows for rulemaking probably from the state health department or something like that. What's, what's the rule on, on uh, you being able to share the milk? You can't charge for it or you can't even share it for free? Uh, I mean... Some people do, but you're. St I mean, if you ever tried to go w go to a local farm that that sold milk by the truckload and get some milk, they're not going to give it to you. Okay. But uh, as far as a herd sharing agreement, you just have to have a formal agreement that you buy part of the cow and you get your share. And you get your share of the milk. All right. Hey, let's talk about your quest for office. Uh, you, f you were formerly a delegate. Probably could have had that job for life if you wanted to stay in the position but you chose to run for governor at one point well actually yeah, yeah your co-host uh at the time said that yeah i could probably hold that position for life if i wanted to but uh i, w I don't want to be a career politician i just kind of step up when i think the need is is there i think it was there in 12 when i did it and i think it's definitely there now and you want to run for state senate this is the seat currently held by craig blair why challenge the senate president uh well, he's kind of an undocumented Democrat. I mean, just look at some of the stuff he's pushed. Uh, he's increased our spending, our total state spending in the last, from 2019 to 2023 fiscal year, has went up total state spending, uh, which includes your special revenue, your general revenue, and your federal dollars, over 41%. In just the last uh, previous year going into this year, and then even this year, uh, even the general revenue spending is up in the, mid to high teens increase over what period of time over the last two years last two years. Our, our last two years are and, and what they passed this year and i didn't do the percentages for this year but they're up there too i mean they're a six billion dollar budget now was that influenced by COVID at all mike uh the early early spending yes because all the federal dollars influx um that's part of it and that's, this is where you get into it's what's caused the inflation as as thomas massey said the day they passed the CARES Act, he said it was the biggest mistake in history. And history has proven him right. We've got, uh, you know, I was an economics major at Shepherd, and uh, I actually, when the inflation hit that top, right around 9%, 10%, I said, what would this be pre when they changed the way they measured inflation? I said, she said it would be just right where it was back in the late 70s, early 80s, 16 to 18% level. Yeah, it's awful easy now to criticize the actions taken during COVID, uh, but in real time, uh, people are losing their jobs. They had no money, no uh, money coming in. Uh, actually, it's many people, especially uh, experts in their field, whether it was Martin Kohldorf out of uh, Harvard, whether it was uh, uh, fell out of Stanford, Jay Bhattacharya, um, Sinatra from Oxford, they came out with what they called, instead of shutting the country down, they said, hey, we need to have uh, focused protection for those who are vulnerable. It was called the Great Der Barrington Declaration, but it was censored by the media. It was censored. Matter of fact, there are emails that came out from uh, that were gotten through FOIA of Fauci wanting to censor people that were highly published, highly uh, thought of in their field. It, it, you know, and that's here's the key. It's easy to criticize, you say, but leaders have to be leaders. They have to speak up. And when I'm talking about leaders, whether it's in the medical field, if you're a state senate president, if you're a state senator, you need to reach out to those people that have knowledge, get both sides of the story, and then make decisions. And shutting down the country, shutting down the state of West Virginia, in my opinion, the last four years, the way it was done is the biggest it's the issue of our lifetime, and we need to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's what the problem is, is the, the people in Charleston, especially my opponent, he represents Charleston and the big money interests and not our local citizens. By his own admission, or at least by his paperwork, he claims to be down there six days a week. 
That's not representing this district. That's not representing his constituents. That's representing the people that cut him checks. Mike, we haven't met before. What is, so I get a little into the, the governing philosophy. We, we talk about um, increasing the budget, increasing spending over the, the course of, of, of the last few years. Stipulate that that's true. But in spite of the increase in spending, we are last in education. We are first in addiction. We are first or among the first in uh, uh Foster care, you know, we just heard last week in one county, 44% of all the children in the county are in, uh, in foster care. So what is the purpose of government if it is not to spend some bucks and, and take care of, of the populace? Well, first of all, you mentioned education. How many of those dollars are getting to the classroom? Uh, very, not as much as you would think. Uh, but, but is cutting back the solution? No, no. But giving a billion dollars to a department in West Virginia that didn't exist three or four years ago so they can hand it out to corporations is not the solution either. I would rather, like, I had to, I, I've been doing weekly talks on for Sunday evening on a Rumble channel. It's Folk, the number four WV on Rumble, and I, I take up topics of interest. And, of course, one of the topics, two of the topics that you mentioned sort of uh, right now is, uh, is an example, the IDD waiver, if you know what that is. Um, they didn't give it, I mean, they didn't give the money that, that was easily there. I mean, a perfect example is this budget, and this has happened every I year. Say, we say they. We've got to get, get away from the pronouns. Who are they now? Well, the leaders. The okay. leaders, if you don't know how it works in Charleston, not very many people speak up. They do what they're told by, whether it's the finance chair, the Speaker of the House, the Senate president. And in case of, of on the Senate side, the leadership is a, a iron fist. Uh, it's clear you can talk to anybody. I had so many people say, hey, Mike, I'm, I'm, please run, please run. You need to run. And, and those are people in both chambers um, and, of course, local people. And in the case of education, though, the issue that I talked about last night was, uh, you know, we had the Senate uh, finance chair and then the Senate president from the area. We had the House finance. And you can't get locality pay passed. It's a simple concept that, that – and it's not – it wouldn't just help Berkeley. It would help outside the district. It would help Jefferson. It would obviously help Hampshire, which borders Virginia. It would help Morgan County, which also borders both uh, Virginia and Maryland. And we have it at the federal government level, uh, and it would benefit like towns like uh, Mon County over in Morgantown. That would help – I mean, because they border Pennsylvania, and people can go across the border and make tens of thousands of dollars more. So as far as education goes, it's priorities. So put that in the form of a plan. How would you do that? How would, how would you get, if, if you're elected, how, how would you implement, how would you convince all those other 55 counties Well, first to of all, you have to, you can't, you have to assure them that you're not going to uh, um, lower their pay. Their pay needs to stay the same. And, and you know, these 5% increases are a joke. When you have a, a when I say 5% increase, the reason it's a joke is because of the inflation tax. I mean, Inflation is much has been much more than that over the last three or four years. So a five percent is just a joke. Mike, uh, Rob mentioned that you had been uh, a delegate for quite a while. Why did you not? Why did you choose to run against Blair for the fifteenth as opposed to running in Hardy's seat, the forty seventh, the I just the ninety seventh? Yeah. Well, I believe uh, first of all, I think there's a good there's some good candidates in the ninety seventh right now. So. I'm not concerned about that district. Where the help is really needed and, and where the roadblocks are for, for issues like another issue, uh, you know, because you've got these ads running. I mean, he's basically, because of all the money, he's gotten bought out all, tons of ads, at, not just here but everywhere. But uh, as an example, in the, ho in the, the House passed a couple years ago a bill that would prevent uh, allowing uh, doctors to mutilate children or to give them chemical castration drugs, which is what Lupron is. They call them puberty blockers, which is a nice way to put it. But they are used for basically two things historically have been used for a cancer treatment, and the other is to sterilize uh, sex offenders. So that bill came over from the House blocking both those things for underage people because, quite frankly, they, can't, they're, they have enough issues without uh, making a life-changing decision like that and in, in the case of the Senate, because they're run by WVU Medicine, 
two of the doctors over there are associated with them. They do their bidding. Craig Blair does their bidding too because, for instance, he's got the max contribution from, me, as one example, the CEO of WVU Medicine. Uh, they got they gutted that part of the bill. So literally, the Senate voted by amending out that portion to allow chemical castration of minors. That's just wrong. I mean, that's one of the things I'm running about. The other thing is, and, and you can look at this. You know, you hear them coming here all the time, whether it's Craig Blair or or uh, Eric Hauser, and they say we've got flat budgets. You've heard that expression? When I left the House in 2018 was my last year, the back end, the surplus spending, was 13, I think it was $13.7 million. And I hadn't looked at this until recently. I looked at the, both the comparing budgets year to, year to year and also looking at the actual uh, annual reports that come out, you know, your annual reports which shows your budget your actual budget, and then your spending. That's where you get the numbers and what the actual spending was. They back in, like I said, 18, we back in loaded $13.7 million. And we've known every year when we went in the session for the last two or three years that we've got hundreds of millions of dollars of surplus. So when you back in load that budget in your mind, knowing that you've got hundreds of millions of dollars of surplus, you know that when you put that money in there, it's going to get spent. As an example right now, what, what's the current budget surplus? It's over. It's probably right a half. Out, it's 400 plus million right now. So back end loaded budget, just under the regular budget, just under 6 billion. They back end loaded 120 million. That money will be spent in next year's budget. So it really needed to be included in those two or three years that I'm talking about. They back end loaded one year over a billion dollars, mm -hmm. knowing that they had 600 and some million dollars when they passed that. So they were spending. They were just, quite frankly, it was. <laughs> Creative accounting, I guess, is the way you would put it. Specifically, what is in your platform? I know you don't like Craig Blair, but what is your, in your Pacific platform? What oh, well, will you do if you're Senate? I'll represent. So. It's pretty simple. I'll represent the district. I'll represent their interests. I'll uh, I'll hold people accountable in government, just like I did back then. You can look on the, uh, on the, on my uh, flyer I sent you. You know, we I did. We got a lot of stuff done. Uh, you know, passing the budget, one of the things that I accomplished, somebody else takes, tries to take credit for it, but in, in 2017, I wrote a guest uh, common, uh, column called The Budget Paradigm, which was getting the legislature to pass a budget during the regular session and not extend session. So, uh, you know, I'll hold government more, more accountable. Uh, you know, let me put it this way. Since I left, this state has become a more communist state in the sense that governments actually own businesses, have bought out private businesses. I don't I believe in that. You're referring to foreign energy at a minute well, here? No, no, no. That's that's the other part, which is basically fascism where they get in bed with uh, businesses. And in the case of foreign energy, I'm glad you brought that up, Rob. And I did a video on this. Everybody should look on my Rumble channel. Do you know what the, by the full Full manufacturing capacity of that plant, you know how many, how much the people are going to average in salary compensation? How much? Over $600,000, according to the report done by D John Deskins. Each individual? Each individual. It's right there. I got the report. You won't believe it. I, I challenge you to go watch my video. It's less than 20 minutes long. It's, it's a PowerPoint presentation. It's a fraud. Now, it's a fraud in the sense that they were told what numbers they had to use. Are you saying flawed with an L or no. F R? Well, it could be a flawed. You can you, you can use the term flawed, or can you can use the term fraud? Are you using fraud with an L? I I said fraud when you first asked. All right. All right. And so the under, the way you have to understand that is the second sentence in Deskin's report. You have to read it. Data for this study were provided by the West Virginia Development Office and were not independently audited by the authors. Now, do you know why he put that in there? It's because his model, using the one and a half billion dollar economic output and the job, 750, if if you really put the one and a half billion dollars in there, and the model, and I got this straight from John Deskins, I have an email chain between two legislators and the city of uh, Wheeling's mayor asking, how did you come up with this six hundred thousand dollars for per job? He said, look, I had to use what they told me to use. And they told me to use 750 jobs, when in actuality, 
If you don't know, the state of West Virginia's G, total GDP is about 80, uh, 80 to $90 uh, billion. So it's massive in that sense if you really produce in five years $1.5 billion of economic output. It would really create about 10 times that many jobs. So the re reality is if that's what it produces, for, there really is going to be uh, – I mean, first of all, it's not going to happen. It was done that way. He was told to do that on the fly really quick because – they were having concerns because people in the Economic Development Authority and state, including some finance people, it didn't add up. They actually said that this is not this is not right, and they were going to start speaking against it. And they actually did vote against the first tranche of money that came before the legislature get, legislature approved almost three hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, it's funny. I talked to my father-in-law, who's not into politics at all, but he's an electrical engineer by trade. He's retired now. Eighty. He's over. 80, just turned eighty-one. And I, and I talked about the battery. That technology has been around for 40 to 50 years, the iron air technology. And I said, how, how viable is it? He goes, you know, look, if it's a great thing, then why do we need to give them money to do it? The, first of all, some of the biggest people are there are Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. If, I, the only reason that, job, that, that plan is coming here, you understand what it is, right? Go ahead. It's called Inflation Reduction Act, which people call it the Green New Deal because that's what's in there. And it's the same reason that we see wall to wall. I mean, in Berkeley and Jefferson County now that I'm aware of, there's almost 5,000 acres have been approved to put solar panels. By itself, they would not exist. Part of that Inflation Reduction Act, you go look at it, includes. It, uh, if you put for if it depends on whether it's below one megawatt or above one megawatt, you're getting uh, the person that puts it in 2.75 cents per kilowatt hour kicked back to you as a as a tax credit. However, if you are a nonprofit or a government entity that puts it in, they actually cut you a check for 2.75 cents per megawatt hour. And on top of that, they give you a 30 percent tax credit for putting them in. How is that different in principle than the government subsidies for for farmers who let their fields go fallow? For first of all, that program hadn't been on for, uh, around for a long time. It was around for a long time. How is it different in principle? Well, in West Virginia, as an example, because the cost of solar is is I mean, is, government is more. Been, government has been subsidizing different things for for eons, right? So how is it different to, to subsidize? Does it make it right? It, but but it is whether just because it's solar, a, a, a green energy thing, as opposed to something else. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering. There's a, there's a little it, bit of difference. If they, it, it, they, I'm, I'm just wondering. It seems like it's politically loaded as opposed to principally loaded. Well, this is politically loaded. But the, uh, to compare your two exa your example with my example, this is what I, I refer to. We used to refer to it for a long time. It's called the last crop. And in essence, when you put solar panels down, they're in there for 20 to 30 years. And you take up the topsoil when you do it. And it's ironic. You know, I'm an airline pilot by trade, so I see stuff all over the country that the average person doesn't see from my view. And as an example, in north northeast of uh, Richmond, they're cutting down trees to put solar panels in. How does that make any green, quote, green sense? As a practical matter, though, is which is better for the environment, <clears throat> acres and acres of solar panels or acres and acres of townhouses and apartments? Well, because these farmlands are not people where, where people decide not to farm and the generate third generations away, third generation away from the farmers. They, they get to sell their land and they're going to sell it to something. So I, why not to solar farms well, as they're opposed not, to typically they're not selling them, they're renting them, but, but leasing them. But, but first of all, there's a little uh, it's kind of ironic that you mentioned because everything that you talk about, all the negatives have been caused by subsidies. And whether it's the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates artificially low so people just, you know, the sprawl happens. Uh, you know, this is something that didn't start overnight, and it's not going to end overnight. But I think I can be a small piece, and more importantly, a small piece that that speaks for the average citizen in the district. Mike, we've got four minutes left. Go ahead. Did you have a follow-up, John? Well, I was just going to say, so shifting gears, what is is? So as, if elected, what do you do? How do you fix it? What's What's your plan? Well, first of all, be a voice of reason in Charleston. I think <clears throat> because of what I told you about how it works in Charleston, the Iron Fist type thing, anybody can tell you that I can speak well on the floor. 
I use data. That's the reason I brought this, not to show you everything. But there's tons, and I will represent the district and not Charleston. And, you know, one of the big things that we didn't even talk about is health care. And one of the biggest things right now, in, but not just in West Virginia, but the whole country is health care. We have to slowly return back to a free market health care system. And right now, uh, because people are in Charleston, many leaders are bought out by the, the medical oligopoly, not monopoly, because there's two major players in West Virginia in the hospital system, and they drive up costs. And that's all caused by what they call certificate of need. If, 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 and that's something for definitely a different day. I can't talk about that over two and a half minutes. <clears throat> now, I'm going to represent the district. I'm not going to represent Charleston. Mike, I wanted to ask you about education, but I know we can't fix that in two and a half minutes either. So just give me a couple of bullet points about Mike Folk's approach to improving education in West Virginia. Well, put the power back into the classroom, uh, get teachers, qualified teachers, pay them more to make them competitive with the local area or the uh, adjoining states. And whether you like it or not, Common Core and its associated pedagogy is still in West Virginia. They just changed the name. And uh, and I, I when I ran for governor or ran for uh, one of my reelections when I was pushing trying to get rid of Common Core, you know I had the whole math department at the time at, at Hedgesville High School supporting my position on that, and the whole math department at Musselman supporting my position on that. And of course I knew the ones from Hedgesville because I'd went there. I knew the ones at Musselman because I taught there. And so you know, and that's as far as education goes. My biggest thing is my. Uh, relationship I have with educators because I'm a former educator. My wife is a she was she's a permanently certified teacher, taught for 14, 15 years. Now she's staying home with five kids, um, and I've got a relationship with teachers across the state. Really, because of what some of the stuff I did during the teacher strike, I actually was honest with the teachers. I told I showed the teachers the data, and. A lot of them found out my positions on education, found out I was in education, and they reached out to me. So the biggest thing is I have, a, I, have a, I have a relationship with local teachers and teachers across the state. Got a minute left. Go ahead and tell the uh, members of our audience why they should vote for you for state senate, Mike. Well, it's pretty, pretty clear that uh, somebody's been in Charleston too long, almost 20 years. Uh, that happens. Uh, it's time for new blood. It's time for the district to be represented, the citizens to be represented. Uh, I've got a website, Folk the number four wv.com i've got a town hall actually uh at the uh, tomahawk ruatan on wednesday 7 p.m anybody wants to show up uh i'll take your questions uh, this wednesday or every wednesday this wednesday this wednesday every sunday excluding this sunday coming up because it's easter i do a uh, uh a discussion on rumble and that's also if you get on rumble uh folk the number four wv.com i stream that on facebook also live and that's my facebook page is michael folk is my personal one michael folk for west virginia you can find that on facebook i'm also on twitter um you can it's michael folk for west virginia or uh, at michael folk that's f-o-l-k three four my old college football number uh is the handle and uh and believe it or not say uh you know as bad as twitter was during COVID, you know for instance they banned uh, robert malone you ever heard of robert malone mm -hmm. It was the uh, one of the original patent holders of the mRNA came out against it, but now the free speech place there are really two Rumble and uh, Twitter now called X. Right. All right. Uh, how did you get the number thirty four as a receiver? At Shepherd, ah, uh, you know, I, you know, when I played football at Hedgesville, I was uh, def I was all state defensive back, played you know in the north south game, and then also, uh, but on offense in high school, I was a little bit of everything. I, I played. I was a starting wing back, but I actually started a couple games during my career at tailback. Uh, I even got stuck in by Frank Alavito against Loudon Valley as a tight end because I was the only one who had to do the twenty-four rocket. The tight end at the time wasn't doing a very good job, and I was low enough and wrestler. I knew how to use leverage, and, but I, you know, I was probably not. I wasn't on a full scholarship to start with, so I just lucked out and got thirty-four. So those are back in those days. The '80s were always the receiver numbers. Hey, uh, thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Best of luck to you. 832. And oh, can I say one last thing? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my number is 304-279-6797. You can text me with questions. You can call me. Thank you. And we'll see you at our candidate forum in April. Yes.